Well, we're in the Gospel of John, and uh, we're going to be there for a while. Um, we've been, the last couple of Sundays, exploring kind of the metaphor of, of the idea that in the Gospel of John, there are threads of ideas which are woven through the fabric of the text that come time and again. I've likened it to a, a carpet. I got a, a couple more pictures for you here. I, I was, when I was on sabbatical in the fall, I uh, was in Turkey and in, in Ephesus, and one of the stops was to, uh, kind of after we toured the city of Ephesus, the ancient ruins, uh, was to see Turkish carpets that are handmade. I said a little bit about that last week. It was an elaborate show. Um, there was a, a, a fairly, uh, in, it was sort of fairly, there was a absolutely intentional sales pitch attached to the idea that you want to take one of these carpets home with you and they'll ship it to you, etc. They're beautiful, um, woven with all kinds of detail. Uh, and and the, the, when I say elaborate, they would roll them out and the, it was, it, yeah, it was really, it was a choreographed show um, and talking about the different materials that they've been made with and stuff. And uh, that was my favorite one there. If I'd had an extra 10 grand, I uh, could have brought that carpet home. Um, and so, uh, uh, anyway, but you see the colors, and they're woven, and there's themes that are there, and we're, we're describing the Gospel of John as this, this tapestry that, that ultimately is intended to reveal Jesus to us if we will look, if we will listen. And this morning we get to chapter five, the second part of chapter five, and this very intentional uh, declaration of who Jesus Jesus is in the words of Jesus, on the lips of of Jesus. Uh, It was just a couple of weeks ago that we were with Jesus in Cana in Galilee, which is in the north part of, uh, of Israel, Uh, and it was there that Jesus performed what John calls the first of the signs through which Jesus revealed his glory. Uh, the first of the signs. And then last Sunday we were uh, in the end of chapter four where Jesus again is in Cana. So we kind of get this, this book ending of thematic content in John. And Jesus is there again and, and, and we're told that it was the second sign that Jesus had performed uh, in that region. Now we know that there are a bunch of signs because there have been several references to them, but there are, there are, are gonna be seven signs in particular that John is gonna emphasize for us, calling them specifically to our attention. And we say, well, why would that be? You know, you know, what's, what's about those seven in particular? We're gonna, we're gonna, we'll talk about that a couple of Sundays from now. Um, Last week, then we got to the end of chapter four, which kind of concludes a segment, and then we bro- bridged into chapter five, and kind of the, the link is our healing stories that are back to back. We have the, the healing of a certain uh, royal official's son. He came from Capernaum over to Cana uh, to seek Jesus, to plead with Jesus for the healing of his son. Um, Jesus uh, said, go home, he's gonna be fine. Uh, and at that very hour, he was, he was healed. Well, you get into chapter five, and there's another healing account, and, and we looked at that last Sunday. It's, Jesus goes back to Jerusalem, and it's this man who's been at the pool of Bethesda, and he's been, th- he's been, uh, he has been disabled for 38 years, uh, and unable to experience healing, arduous, difficult season, and, and we say, well, as we compare and contrast these two healings, what are, what are the similarities, what are the differences, and what is it that John is communicating to us in his gospel as this fabric continues to unfold and the picture of Jesus continues to unfold, um, and, and we ha- we're forced to kind of recognize that in this second healing, in the first one, clearly this man went home and it says he and his household believed. And in the, the, the second healing, chapter five, we don't really get any kind of indication of that. Um, and, and, and again, we're, we're brought to this place where we're like, man, the, the people who should have believed, those who ought to have figured this out, don't seem to. And those who seem to be on the outside, those who are the fringe, those who you wouldn't have expected would believe Jesus, would respond to Jesus, they're the ones, they're the ones who are, are believing. And we're asking, what's up with that? Particularly significant then, of course, is that this second healing, the one in Jerusalem, Pool of Bethesda, the guy that had been disabled for 38 years, that took place on a Sabbath. And this becomes a really big deal. 
for them. Um, on the Sabbath, uh, the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, uh, the books of Moses, sometimes they're called, uh, said, keep the Sabbath day holy. Um, and then the Jewish leaders put some more rules around that to kind of protect it, safeguard it, to, to fence that idea uh, so that people wouldn't mess with it. Well, and then here's Jesus doing what clearly is, in, is considered to be work on the Sabbath. And, and, and it does a couple of things. Uh, firstly, verse 16 uh, we're told this. So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. They began to persecute him, to harass Jesus. Um, and, and we're gonna see increasing conflict as we make our way through uh, the, gospel, the Gospel of John. And, and this morning, we're, we're looking specifically at Jesus' response to rejection. Uh, a number of people here seem to be rejecting Jesus. The list is going to grow. Next Sunday, we'll look at, at more uh, who, are, who are rejecting Jesus. They're walking away from him. And, and, and it may be that you find yourself in, in a place of sympathy with them. Um, if you've ever been uncertain about Jesus, uh, if you've ever begun to doubt who Jesus is and what he claims. If you've ever even been inclined to reject Jesus, or if you've ever known someone in this category, Jesus wants to speak directly to you this morning. He's gonna offer us an apologetic, to use a big word, a, an apologetic, an authoritative explanation or defense of his claims. We're gonna hear it on the, on the lips of Jesus himself. What do we believe, what ought we believe about Jesus, and why do we believe, why ought we believe those things about Jesus? Well, Jesus himself has some things for us to pay attention to here in our text this morning, straight from him. And let me say, maybe you're in, with us in person or you're with us online, and, and you, quite frankly, are kind of standing on the outside looking in. You've been wondering about Jesus, or you've been wondering about his church. I wanna invite you to stoke your curiosity this morning, and to be willing to genuinely and, and, and transparently, with, with maybe walls down, to say, well, well what about these things that Jesus has said. Here's, here's kind of the big idea we're gonna come back to this morning. God with skin on, his name is Jesus. God with skin on is offering you life. God with skin on is offering you life. Will you accept it? Here's how John records Jesus' response to the rejection that's going on around him. Firstly, we hear Jesus saying that, that he does God-sized stuff. He does God-sized stuff. And secondly, we're gonna observe, we're gonna hear him say God-sized things. He does God-sized stuff, he says God-sized things, and, and then third, he has God-sized endorsements. And it's gonna lead us to, 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 to recognize there really are only two possible responses to Jesus, to the things that are being presented to us here. So we're gonna read the passage this morning. Quite often, I like to read a big chunk of scripture. I think it's helpful and good for us to do that. This morning, we're gonna read it in smaller chunks because frankly, it's, it's thick kind of weed your way through it, and I want to make sure that you capture it as we go. So look at, if you have your Bibles, you can turn. It will be on the screen here. John chapter 5. I'm going to start in verse 16, where we left off last Sunday. Um, and as I say, we'll go in, in sort of segments here as, as we go. This is the word of the Lord. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation, if you're looking it up on your phone or something like that. 
So the Jewish leaders began harassing Jesus for breaking the Sabbath rules. But Jesus replied, my father is always working and so am I. So the Jewish leaders tried all the harder to find a way to kill him. For he not only broke the Sabbath, he called God his father, thereby making himself equal with God. Okay, so we, we get that, right? Like it's all fairly clear. You know, my father's always working, I'm always working. The Jewish leaders want to kill the guy, he broke the Sabbath. Okay, so maybe it's all clear and, and simple, except for this him, making himself equal with God piece, right? Like that ought to cause us some pause to say, what? Like what is really going on here? And, and this kind of takes us to something that John does really nicely for us, all the gospel writers do, but John, I think in particular, there are times when John portrays Jesus and he uses, um, he, he uses man stuff to describe Jesus. He shows us Jesus doing human being stuff, man stuff. He, he gets tired, right? Uh, he gets thirsty. Uh, we'll read about him weeping. Um, he, does, he does man-sized stuff, man, man kinds of things. Sometimes he hangs out with his friends. Uh, sometimes we, we see Jesus alone. And, and we're, we're, we're forced to come to this conclusion that Jesus is fully human. He's fully human. And then there are other places, and there's a lot of this in John, where he, he portrays Jesus and he emphasizes Jesus doing God stuff. So sometimes Jesus is doing man stuff, sometimes Jesus is doing God stuff, like the stuff that God alone can do. And there's a lot of this in the Gospel of John. Uh, it started that way. God, John chapter one, verse one, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, goes on to talk about him creating. Nothing was created that wasn't created by him. That's God's stuff. Uh, first sign, John chapter two, turning water into wine. What? Like water, skipping the whole fruit into vine, into a season of growth, into grape, into harvested, squeezed out, processed, fermented, wait, like skipped all that. Water into wine in seconds. Um, we saw him uh, kick all the merchants out of the temple like as though he owns the place. And, and then he sat, when, when Nicodemus came to challenge him, uh, he, he sat with this teacher of Israel, highly regarded man, and began to teach him. and said, what, you don't understand this? And then we saw him with the Samaritan woman at the well speak things only God could know to her through divine revelation about her past, about things going on in her life. And then we saw him heal a certain royal official's son 25, 24 miles away simply by saying the word and it was done. And then here, we see him breaking Sabbath laws. I mean, that's, that's God's stuff. God spoke them, he gave them to Moses. Remember the Sabbath, keep it holy. And, and yet, Jesus is being presented doing God stuff. Stuff that God alone could do. Jesus is doing this so, so watch for this as we continue to read on. Uh, we, we just read, uh, he's making himself equal with God. I pick it up at verse 19. So Jesus explained, I tell you the truth. Um, th that's another one of those verily, verily I say unto you, okay? Just to make sure that you don't miss that. And NLT kind of smooths, smooths over that for our English modern ears. Uh, but, but don't miss it. It's a, it's a pay attention here and now. I have something very important for you to say. Jesus explained, I tell you the truth, the son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the father doing. Whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him everything he is doing. In fact, the father will show him how to do even greater works than healing this man. Then you will truly be astonished. For just as the father gives life to those he raises from the dead, so the son gives life to anyone he wants. 
In addition, the Father judges no one. Instead, he has given the Son absolute authority to judge, so that everyone will honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Anyone who does not honor the Son is certainly not honoring the Father who sent him. I tell you the truth. Those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death into life. And I assure you, that's another verily, verily, that the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when the dead will hear my voice, the voice of the Son of God, and those who listen will live. The Father has life in himself, and he has granted that same life-giving power to his Son. And he has given him authority to judge everyone, because he is the Son of Man. Don't be so surprised. Indeed, the time is coming when the dead in their graves will hear the voice of God's Son, and they will rise again. Those who have done good will rise to experience eternal life. And those who have continued in evil will rise to experience judgment. I can do nothing on my own. I judge as God tells me. Therefore, my judgment is just because I carry out the will of the one who sent me, not my own will. So let's back this up just a little bit because not only does is Jesus doing God-sized stuff, but here we find him saying God-sized things. There's there's this language here at the beginning. He says, I tell you the truth, the son, this is verse 19, uh, the son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the father doing. I envision, like when I first read that, if you just read that part, it sounds a bit like an apprenticeship relationship, right? I got a picture here of, uh, you know, maybe it's Joseph, uh, and, and Jesus, right? Uh, as a young man in the workshop with his dad, apprenticing, learning uh, how the craft works. But it doesn't stay there because we keep reading on and, and he says, whatever the father does, the son does. Like, whatever the father does, the son does. Uh, for the father loves the son and shows him everything he's doing. In fact, the father will show him how to do even greater works than healing this man and then you will truly be astonished for just as the father gives life to those he raises from the dead are you listening just as the father gives life to those he raises from the dead so the son gives life to anyone he wants like we're moving beyond apprenticeship language here into equality language that the son is equal with the father he does the work of the father in fact the 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 weight of the language is such that Everything the Father has ever done, the Son has been a part of that. It was the work of the Son. We read about it in chapter one, the the, the creating work. He was there, nothing was made that has been made that wasn't made through him. And we've got another picture here that maybe shows, yeah, pictures are limited, but working together, Father, Son, we've already been introduced to Holy Spirit. The scriptures would describe, behold, you know, the Lord our God is one, and he exists in three persons, and he reveals himself to us, and each serve the purpose of the Godhead with specific intent and specific intentionality. Uh, Here are some of the things, some of the God-sized things that Jesus says. He says he will raise the dead. We read that in verse 21. When we get to chapter 11, we're going to see it. John will recount it for us. Uh, Only God commands life. Uh, Jesus says that he has been given all authority to judge. Verse 22. All authority. Are you kidding me? Like, all authority. Verse 23, Jesus says, the honor due the Father is due to the Son. Whatever whatever the one deserves, the other, it's it's fitting to give to the other. And then listen to what Jesus says here. Listen to Jesus' words in verse 24. 
He says, I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins. Are you kidding me? They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death into life. If you will listen to him, just leave this up for me for a second here. If you will listen to him, if you will believe in God, you have eternal life right now. Right now, not waiting until then. It will be true then, but right now, you have stepped into eternity with an assurance. Uh, But then Jesus brings some words together here that are really instructive to us, right? We say, believing in God results in eternal life. But then he's gonna say the same thing results from believing the voice of the Son. Here it is in verse 25. He says, I assure you that the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when the dead will hear my voice, the voice of the Son of God, and those who listen will live. These are not incidental statements. These are statements with eternal consequence. These are statements with, with, with enormous weight. He says, the voice of the Son of God, and we need to just explore that word or that language for, for a minute or two. When we were back in John chapter three, verse 16, uh, we read, for God so loved the world that he gave his, his what? His one and only son, or his only begotten son. Okay, monogene is the Greek there. It, it, one and only, or utterly unique, is the idea there. So, so we are all sons of God. That's not a gender-specific reference. We're all equal heirs to the Father's goodness. We are all sons of God of God. King David. King David was a son of God, particularly celebrated. Um, Had his weaknesses. Uh, The nation of Israel are described in the pages of the Old Testament text as being the son of God. Israel, my son, uh, was supposed to be representing the father, but did so in a halting and failing way. Here we have Jesus as the only son of God, the utterly unique son of God, because he has been utterly faithful. He alone, he alone, he uniquely is entitled to the, this title of son of God. So recap, now Jesus does God-sized stuff, uh, he says God-sized things, And yet, in the tension of all of that, he will not let go of us recognizing that he is fully human, his humanity. Just two verses later, we see Jesus describing himself as the son of what? Son of man. In fact, it's one of his favorite descriptions. It's like it lives in tension with the God stuff that he does. We've got the man stuff that's there as well. Let me read it for you, verse 27. And he, that's referring to the Father, has given him, referring to the Son, authority to judge everyone because he is the Son of Man. Don't be so so surprised. Indeed, the time is coming when all the dead in their graves will hear the voice of God's Son and they will rise again. The day is coming when Jesus will speak and all will rise to him. He says, all those who have done good will rise to experience eternal life, and those who have continued in evil will rise to experience judgment. Okay, now, I I hope there's a big question kind of stirring in your heart. Those who have done good, what's that about? Like, is, is Jesus saying that eternal life can be achieved by good moral behavior. Is, is, is that what he's saying? I mean, we've, we've been tracking with the things that he's been saying in the Gospel of John as we've been making our way along, and that's not the story that we've been seeing, right? 
Time and again, we have had to recognize that those who ought to have known, ought to have figured it out, ought to have followed, ought to have believed, at least at this point, aren't, don't. And those who we thought wouldn't have had any interest, uh, thought were on the outside, right? The, uh, the shepherds, the fishermen, um, a Samaritan woman, a village full of Samaritans. I mean, these aren't the people that were, were supposed to be recognizing the Jewish Messiah when he appeared, and yet they are the ones who are believing in Jesus. And increasingly what we're discovering is that good isn't about moral behavior because no one is good, none of us could be good enough. Good is about what you do with Jesus. Good is about believing Jesus. That's the good that's being described in the Gospel of John. Now, moral behavior matters. Uh, Choosing to avoid sin matters. These are important things. Uh, Jesus said it just last Sunday. We looked at it to the, uh, the, the man who had been disabled for 38 years. He said, uh, stop sinning or something worse will happen to you. We talked about that last Sunday. Um, so, so how we respond, how we live once we come to Jesus matters. Hey, even before we come to Jesus, it matters, but it won't save you. It won't save you. Belief in Jesus, listening to the voice of Jesus and believing is the only thing that separates the good from the evil. What that means is that the evil being described here is simply this. It's continuing in unbelief. Remember, Jesus is talking to religious leaders here who are in the process of rejecting him. Uh, Jesus' actions show who he is and that should have been enough. His words speak who he is, that should have been enough. And yet they're rejecting Jesus so they are continuing in evil. Uh, But Jesus' actions and Jesus' words aren't the only things that continue to testify to who he is and call for a response because Jesus has God-sized endorsements. God-sized endorsements. I'm gonna read on from verse 31, and here's what we find. Jesus says, if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony would not be valid. He's referring to the Old Testament expectation practice uh, that uh, someone else needed to bring testimony for you. Uh, Verse 32, but someone else is also testifying about me, and I assure you that everything he says about me is true. In fact, you sent investigators to listen to John the Baptist, and his testimony about me is true. Okay, so witness number one, God-sized witness number one, John the Baptist. Of course, I have no need for human witnesses, Jesus goes on to say, but I say these things so that you might be saved. John was like a burning and shining lamp, and you were excited for a while about his message, but I have a greater witness than John, my teachings and my miracles. Okay, there's witness number two, my teachings and my miracles. The Father gave me these works to accomplish, and they prove that he sent me, and the Father who sent me has testified about me himself. Okay, there's witness number three. The Father has testified about me himself. You've never heard his voice or seen him face to face, and you do not have his message in your hearts because you do not believe me, the one who sent, uh, the one one he sent to you. You search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life, but the scriptures point to me. There's witness number four, testifying to John the Baptist, Uh, the the teachings and the miracles of Jesus. The Father himself is speaking through all of these things, uh, but at his baptism we would hear the voice of the Father, and he's saying that these are enough. And then the scriptures themselves, he he says the scriptures. So remember, when Jesus is speaking these words, the New Testament does not exist. So the scriptures that he's referring to are the Hebrew scriptures, from Genesis through Malachi, the Old Testament as we sometimes refer to it, the Hebrew scriptures, this is, he says, they, they point to me, yet you refuse to come to me and receive life. Let me just read on. Your approval means nothing to me because I know you don't have God's love within you. For I have come to you in my Father's name and you have rejected me. Yet if others come in their own name, you gladly welcome them. 
No wonder you can't believe, for you gladly honor each other, but you don't care about the honor that comes from the one who alone is God. Like, that's straight up, right? Yet it isn't I who will accuse you before the Father. Moses will accuse you. Yes, Moses, in whom you put your hopes. If you really believed Moses, you would believe me because he wrote about me. So remember, Moses is the primary author behind the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and he's saying the scriptures point to me, and he's saying Moses wrote about me. But since you don't believe that he, what he wrote, how will you believe what I say? There was a a kind of a popular Old Testament understanding or expectation that Moses would be their advocate before the Father. He did it then, you know, 1,300 or so years before. Uh, Moses uh, was the intercessor who stood between the people and God. And there was this expectation that, well, Moses is on our side, he's got our backs, we're gonna be okay. And Jesus is saying, you haven't believed Moses, so he's not on your side. It's, it's a sobering rebuke to those who have been rejecting Jesus. And it's a rebuke that leads us to only two possible conclusions. Only two possible responses. Uh, Ann and I are in, my wife Ann uh, and I are in the process of uh, uh, trying to figure out, okay, when, when are we going to replace some major appliances in our home? They're 18 years old and some of them are starting to fail and, and so on. And if you've ever done anything like this, you, you know, uh, like the, the number of options available, you know, what store do you go to? What, what manufacturer should you, you know, be, be considering? Um, uh, what, uh, what model, what features on what model, you know, what, what's a reasonable amount that you should be spending on something like this. It, 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 it's overwhelming and it feels a little ridiculous sometimes. Um, the options are enormous. It's worse than going to McDonald's for lunch, right? Um, uh, G- Jesus adds no such complications. It's, it, it, it's, it's, it's two things. Yeah. It's life or it's judgment. And I plead with you, receive life. It's only life or judgment. Verse 27, uh, just one more time. And God has given the Son authority to judge everyone because he is the Son of Man. Don't be so surprised. Indeed, the time is coming when all the dead in their graves will hear the voice of God's Son and they will rise again. Those who have done good will rise to experience eternal life, those who have believed. And those who have continued in evil will rise to experience judgment. Now, most of us are uncomfortable with this idea of judgment, and I get it. Uh, I'm very uncomfortable with it. You know, we've read Matthew 7. Judge not, lest ye be judged. Um, just, just a couple of weeks ago, we were in John chapter 3, and, and we heard Jesus say, uh, I did not come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. And we say, well, is that true? Yeah, absolutely, that's true. Yes, these are the words of Jesus. Absolutely, that is true. It is, he didn't come to condemn. He came to save But as we've also just read the words of Jesus, he has been given all authority to judge and and he will exercise that authority. Sometimes in little bits here and there now. Ultimately, at the end of days, comprehensively, holistically, everything, all people will stand before God and it will either be enter into my, your master's delight. Re- receive, you've believed. You listened to Jesus, you've believed. And I know it was halting, I know it was faulty, I know that you really didn't get it all the time. But you, you know, your only claim is Jesus. 
or there will be judgment. I envision a raging river, someone caught in a raging river that's this horrific rapids that are flowing toward a 100-foot waterfall with jagged rocks at the bottom, and there's desperation on the part, and, 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 and then the helicopter comes with the rope that's let down, and those who grab the rope and are willing to be pulled out receive life. Those who don't receive judgment. Judgment has, has, has its uh, central feature, uh, justice. Um, we want justice. Like every time something horrific happens in this world, we say, Where's, we want justice. Uh, every time things go wrong, we say, that, that's not right. I've stood at people's funerals, I've stood at gravesides, and we say, this is wrong, this is wrong. The, the, the problem is we tend to like to grandize the stuff that needs to be judged. You know, it's the axe murderers, it's the rapists, it's the, you know, the villains who march armies across nations. Like, those are the things we want to see judged. And we fail to recognize that actually the fine point of, of sin, the sign, fine point of evil, really tips on what Jesus just said. Believing or not. It started in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve chose not to believe God. It's, it's continued throughout history. Every human being in every season, every era of time has either chosen God or not. And, and here Jesus is, is demonstrating in his deeds, his words, and in those who endorse him that, that he is equal with God. And here we have God saying, choose life. Listen to my words and believe and receive life. God with skin on is offering you life. Will you receive it? Will you receive it? There's an urgency that hangs over this for those who have not yet listened to Jesus, not yet believed. I, re I realize that, I know it, I feel that too. Uh, this past Monday, um, Family Day Monday, uh, Ann and I took my mom down to Frank Slide, uh, to the interpretive center there. And um, uh, it's, it's this, I mean, most of you probably are aware, it's this horrific thing, 1903, April 29, 1903, five, ten, or 410 in the morning, um, 110 metric tons of the mountain, Turtle Mountain, came down, buried a portion of the town, and took 92 people uh, with it. You look back and you say, the peril that hung over that town for how long? Um, but do you, you know what, friends? You, you don't have to live with that sense of peril. You don't have to live with that sense of foreboding, that, that desperate fear. Because we've already been seeing those who've responded to Jesus. They've heard the voice of Jesus. They've, they've seen him, and they have responded, right? We, we've, we've seen that from, from John the Baptist, who said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We've seen it from the, the disciples in chapter one who responded. There was, there was Andrew and his brother Simon Peter and, and Philip and Nathaniel, and they responded to Jesus, and, and we've recognized their response was, 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 was faulty. They said more than that they even knew they were saying, and yet Jesus embraces them and draws them in, they believe, the Samaritan woman at the well, and, and then the town, there's so many in the town who, who believed, they believed, will you believe? They call us to respond. Will, will you repent of your unbelief and say, Jesus, I don't understand, so much I don't understand, but I choose to hear your words and listen. I choose to believe. We're going to continue to be students of the gospel of the Apostle John, students of Jesus as we continue through our series. But for, for now, what I want to just ask you to consider are those two options, those two choices, life or, or, or judgment. And in a few, few minutes, we're going to come to the Lord's table, but before we do that, I, I want to just give you a little bit of time. We're going to sing a couple of songs together in worship, and, and maybe those lyrics are helpful to you to move your heart to a place 
But we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna offer you an invitation to the king's table, the Lord's table. The king of the universe sets a banquet uh, which represents life, and he says, come. Will you believe? Come, come to the table. Uh, so, so take a few minutes to think, a few minutes to, to, to reflect, to pray, uh, to talk to Jesus. What's, what's he saying to you this morning? to choose a posture maybe you want to stand with me but maybe it's better for you to sit or, or kneel as we think and we reflect and we respond together